So I'll just briefly mention one other way that this was tweaked um, to further improve the system, um, as well as uh, to add some interesting elements. Um, so there's two things going on here that rely on how cells perform quorum sensing. So cells have this ability to essentially know how many of each other there are and to modulate um, uh, behavior as a collective. And you see this in, in um, all kinds of systems, whether it be a multicellular organism or even swarms of bacteria, simple E. coli, other bacteria, pathogenic or not, that might form a biofilm. Sometimes they wait until enough are around to mount a particular kind of response. The simplest way of thinking about this is um, usually cells, um, uh, they, they, they have a, actually to some degree an altruistic um, uh, a response in the perspective of their community for their species. And so if they are reaching the point of starvation, they see some nutrient is, um, is really limiting, they will try to, to signal um, so that the whole group might respond um, uh, accordingly. Um, and so you can take some of the machinery um, that comes from quorum sensing in different bacteria um, encoded by some of these ESA-I, ESA-R systems. We can think of, you know, these uh, just related to our biosensors from before. Um, and there were different variations of these, different mutants. Um, you could um, employ that or a different set of RBSs and promoters. And essentially what was shown in this study, um, also from the Preda lab, is that um, by, by doing by including the quorum sensing for control of transcription, as well as a degradation tag on your gene of interest, that's your GOI here, um, to also address that both trans, transcription and uh, you know, a control of how much enzyme you have. Um, you can actually, with these different quorum sensing tools, see that uh, now without the need for adding an inducer, these cells would just uh, recognize this molecule uh, AHL um, which might be uh, acyl homo serian lactone um, it, at, at different quantities of, of cells, really, you, and different stages of growth, you would, you would start to see um, a decrease in, if, in this case, if GFP was your gene of interest, um, you know, you have, you have cells growing and so you have them making more GFP and then, and then you see these different trends of coming down. And what you can see is with these different variants, different cassettes, um, you can control when, when they just naturally come down. So, so you're keeping the dynamic metabolic pathway and now it's, it's doing it on its own. Um, and, and so this uh, panel C here just kind of looks at the switching OD um, and, and shows that more clearly since this is just GFP and the OD here is representative of cell growth. Um, and, and um, you know, this can be predicted as well. So we've been talking about this idea of dynamic metabolic control and, and several examples from the Prather lab that were all unique and, and interesting and different. Um, but I wanted to, to tie this back into real metabolic engineering at, at the commercial and industrial level and, and sort of make this connection of why this, this could be important or powerful. Um, so there's a startup. Um, it's called DMC Bio. Uh, they have a website. You can check it out. Um, they, on their website, they include their corporate presentation. Um, and so this is actually from not that long ago um, and freely available. So I thought I'd share some slides. You know, DMC stands for Dynamic Metabolic Control. Um, and so their approach here, um, kind of cheeky, is you know taking different statements like people might ordinarily say in the field, biology is complex. Okay, simplify the problem. Um, you know these high throughput approaches don't actually predict things when you scale up. Well, okay, let's let's use something that scales and and let's standardize things. Um, and so what they're doing, and this is the basis of of their commercial technology, really their whole company. Um, of course, they've got specific products that they, they may go after, but it's metabolic engineering using dynamic metabolic control. Um, and uh, so you can imagine you've got this gene there in at least this illustration describing that they're going to silence it. Um, seems like an antisense RNA kind of strategy. And that, um, you know, to get rid of the enzyme that's already there, they're going to induce proteolysis and degrade. And why are they going to do this? Well, to create two stages. 
um, growth and production so that, you know, you've got this complex metabolic network that you always have in your cell, um, naturally at least. And then you can flip the switch and now you've got the streamlined, um, we've shown in here in green, probably your heterologous metabolic pathway that you've introduced um, to make your product, um, shifting the emphasis from biomass to product. And you can see how then as they're quantifying either OD or titer, you got this biomass buildup, you don't have very much product in red until that point, and then you do the switch, and now all of a sudden you've got this big vat of, of cells that are not still, you know, uh, competing um, with you and your, and your process. And so when you think about this, you know, especially um, from my perspective of metabolic engineering, you look at where the field was originally all these calculations of theoretical yield, right? And, and, um, and, and part of this, uh, the theoretical yield doesn't necessarily assume that your, um, that your cells are um, diverting the flux, but certainly when you do flux balance analysis and, and you do this kind of static steady state model and you, you think, okay, well, the cell, if we go back to the idea of MoMA, it wants to minimize how much flux it sends to your pathway, so it's going to keep all the other fluxes going. Well, take a synthetic biology-inspired approach. You can literally turn off those essential pathways at some point. Um, and when you do that, uh, the kind of flux balance predictions one might make go sort of out the window. Um, and so that's why this, this idea of decoupling growth from production is, is a pretty powerful one. Um, and, and there are folks who have taken this a step further, uh, who've also imagined that you don't even need the cell, you can do that in, in a cell-free context. Um, we're not going to spend uh, too much time talking about the merits of that, but that is another way to um, decouple growth from production.